Folks, there are two types of people in the world. There are those that divide people into two types, and there are those that don't. And I fall into the second category. So I can tell you with great confidence that there's actually three types of people in the world. Those that make things happen, those that watch things happen, and those that say, what the heck happened? Now, we need to move from the third category to the first category. We need to be much more mindful of making things happen our way. As you heard, I'm a physicist. And in physics, you learn that all energy is beautiful and you learn to use all energy optimally to be most efficient. Me, my heart sings when I can see any energy usage being employed in the most productive, efficient way that makes use of the laws of physics to the optimum. So I'm in favor of all energy. Africa is big. We've seen a couple of pictures this morning. Africa is larger than China, the United States, and Europe added together. It sounds amazing, but it's true. Numbers of countries in Africa have 5% electrification or 10% electrification. South Africa at the moment is sitting somewhere at about 77. It's reasonably difficult to measure these numbers, but we way ahead. South Africa produces and uses more than half of the electricity of the entire continent of Africa. Many of our African friends next door, and I've spoken to many of them, and by next door I mean large way up the continent, are sitting with 5% electrification of the continent. You cannot drive an economy into the future on the basis of 5% electrification. It is not fair for African kids to do schoolwork by candlelight when American children are doing schoolwork by electric light, then they say these guys need foreign aid. I'm opposed to foreign aid anyway, but that's another issue. I just want people to pitch up here with text, uh, checkbooks and buy stuff. There's lots of brains in Africa. There's lots of competence here. Pitch with a checkbook and buy stuff, and we'll supply it. Don't come over the foreign aid and then take most of it back anyway. Africa needs progress. African solutions for Africa. And that means things that work for us fast and are affordable, affordable electricity. We need electricity as cheap as possible so that people can go ahead and make stuff. You cannot go along with a wheelbarrow carrying things or doing hand carvings with a pocket knife and expect to be internationally competitive. You need electric drills, you need machinery, you need to get going. The, as we heard earlier, the poor tend to pay more. When you have dilute electricity and so on, it's much more costly and much greater percentage of the income of, of a poor person than somebody who is higher up the social bracket. To my mind, nuclear power is the answer. I'm a nuclear scientist, proud of it, unashamedly so. Nuclear power is the answer for the future. I believe in 100 years' time, 200 years' time, and the eras when we're flying to Mars for holidays and things, the world will be nuclear, and they will look back on the year 2000, 2010, and wonder why the heck we wondered so long about getting into nuclear quickly. We have big nuclear reactors such as Kuburg that produce 2,000 megawatts. We need smaller reactors like Pebble Bed Nuclear Reactor which produces about 100 megawatts. Which is about the um, one Pebble Bed Reactor produces about as much electricity as East London needs to give you an illustration. But the total electricity consumption of Uganda I believe at the moment is 500. In other words, five Pebble Beds approximately, four or five Pebble Beds. So, we need to look seriously at what we are going to do. I'm all in favor of solar power. I'm all in favor of wind power, but only where they are genuinely economically advantageous and where they work. And this is where innovation needs to come in, and we need to find solutions. Okay? There are numbers of places in South Africa still, and certainly in Africa, where it is, Africa is so large, there's so many rural people, 80% of Africa being rural, a gentleman said earlier on. You can't run big power lines to 100 people that are maybe 100 kilometers away from your main power line. It is just never going to be profitable. We need intelligence to solve problems. Now, I want to use three words here. Base, bonus, basic. Okay? There's base load electricity. There's bonus electricity. And then what I want to call basic electricity. Base load is that electricity which you know is going to be there all of the time. Like coal-fired power stations, nuclear-fired power stations. You cannot be doing open-heart surgery connected to the wind turbine and then the wind stops. Okay, you need base load that you know is going to be there. 
I got a reasonable shock a couple of years ago. I keep thinking I'm I'm a reasonably smart guy, and every so often something comes up and it makes you think twice. I was sitting talking to a number of representatives of African countries, and they were pointing out to me how much they're dependent on hydro. And when it doesn't rain, the country's electricity supply goes down. And I thought, jeepers, why didn't I think of that? When hydro is your primary or only source of electricity. I was thinking, what happens if you lose 10% of your power? As I spoke to one African delegation, I said, gee, if you guys lose 10%, he said, 10%, look at this. And he whipped out a book and he opened it up and said, look at the numbers. One power station had lost 73% of its output. Another one, 46 He said, on average, we're talking half because it hasn't rained. African dams are big, wide surface area, not too deep. So in other words, you lose a meter off an African dam, you've lost a lot of volume and a lot of pressure. The hydro schemes in Norway and places are in vertical Vs like this between the mountains and it relies on snow coming down, ice runoff and that. So you're pretty sure that those things are going to work all of the time. Here, hydro is a very variable thing. How on earth can you plan an economy into the future on the basis that you might lose half the country's electricity over the next couple of years because it didn't rain? That's out. Now, baseload means you've got it all the time. Okay? Bonus is something like wind and solar that when you get it, you get it and you're lucky about it, that you can add on. Something like wind is intermittent. You get wind energy when the wind blows. In England, during the height of the freeze at Christmas, there was no wind and the British wind turbines all stopped turning. What's more, they had to pump electricity into the gearboxes to stop the gearboxes freezing. So at the moment they needed extra electricity during the height of the freeze, the wind turbines were absorbing electricity to stop the gearboxes freezing up. That is not a solution. I am opposed to wind power going onto the national grid. I am opposed to solar power going onto the national grid. We are wasting our time sitting and worrying about that stuff. I am in favor of wind power and solar power cunning solutions where you can take the the intermittent nature of that power and build it into something. Put a a wind turbine in such a place that there's water at the bottom of a height and a tank at the top, and when the wind blows, you lift the water up. Then come demand time at evening, you can turn it on, like the big pump water storage scheme in the Drakensberg, and that you can let the water run down the hill and run the turbine when you need it for supper time in the evening. So you've got control over when you want it. There's lots of places where this type of thing can be done. I know a number of very clever solutions. But my third one, basic, I happened to go down, President Zuma asked me to go and run a chess tournament down in Nkanja just before Christmas. I went down there, we did it. Uh, he pitched up and played chess with the kids and invited me and my colleagues around to his house the next day and we went and had a look and we toured around. I managed to get an Air Force helicopter and we flew around over the area. That place has got hills like this. There are people sitting with a village, or not even a village, six or seven huts halfway down a hillside. There's no ways you're going to get an electric power line to many of those people in anything approaching uh, in a profit, profitable way. Now, there's numbers of those places where you might be able to lift water up or you can put wind there and you can draw wind power or solar power or something to give those people something. That's what I'm turning to basic. I had a dinner a while ago, three gentlemen from the DRC. They found my name somewhere on an internet thing or something and they arrived in South Africa and they asked to see me and have dinner. I had the most interesting dinner with these three gents. Um, we, we went out and we sat there and they had their best clothes on, very, very nice guys in their mid-40s or so. And we were chatting and the one fellow said to me, oh, he lives in a village somewhere and he's got a solar panel on the roof and he's got a battery and the battery picks up the solar during the day and he can run his TV set at night. He can only get a black and white television because he can't get enough energy to drive color, only black and white. And then he said a very telling thing. He said to me, having electricity that I can turn on my television makes me a citizen of the world. He said, without the television, I'm just a member of a local tribe. And he said to me, just turning on that TV, I can see Barack Obama standing for office. I can see there was an earthquake in Haiti. I can see this. He says, I belong to the planet when I can turn on a TV set. He said, when I haven't got electricity, he said, I'm just a member of the tribe in the bush. And you know how that struck me? So to somebody like that, just having enough electricity to turn on the TV set, three lights and something makes a difference. 
let's get out there to all those people who haven't got any, and let's give them basic electricity wherever we can get cunning solutions, which are likely to be solar or wind or something like that, or maybe a pebble bed reactor in an area where we can have an industrialized area with a short distribution system. I was invited to give a presentation in London, and I made up some slides and that, and I sat scratching my head to make some pictures that would mean something, and I started to get surprises. One of them is the distance from Pretoria to Cape Town, and bear in mind most of South Africa's coal sits in the Mpumalanga coal fields on the other side of Pretoria and on the top end of KZN. The distance from Pretoria to Cape Town is the same distance as London to Berlin. Here I stood talking in London. Do you know that half of Cape Town's electricity is provided by Coburg Nuclear Power Station, the Western Cape? The other half of the Western Cape's electricity is supplied by coal from the other side of Pretoria. Now imagine in London, if I said to the London guys, how would you feel if half the electricity of London is coming from Berlin? Everybody said that would be utterly unacceptable. Strategically, we could not run an economy on the basis that we have to rely on it. As it happens already, the UK, by the way, is importing a lot of nuclear electricity from France on cables under the North Sea, which they very rarely tell anybody. So congratulations to the French for exporting to the British and the Italians and whoever else their nuclear electricity. I don't like it when you hear words tax. Funding. Funding meaning somebody give us some money as against funding in the sense that you get a bank loan which you're expected to repay with interest. Reefer tariffs. Reefer tariffs should be scrapped. That is just faking the economics. Okay? We've got to go out there and make the stuff genuinely profitable because if you don't do that, somewhere down the line, somebody pays for it. In physics, there's laws of thermodynamics, and the laws of thermodynamics tell you you can't get more heat out than you put in. It's just not allowed. You cannot make perpetual motion machines. They stop. The same sort of thing happens with finance. You cannot keep taxing or funding or something and the money falls out of the sky. If you're taking all this artificial money to artificially keep wind and solar and what are going on a refit tariff at something like 5 to 10 to 15 times what it cost, South Africa is proposing to pay something like f up to 4 rand uh, for electricity from wind, and then we resell it at something like 80 cents. So you buy for four rand and you resell for 80 cents. Now tell me the logic in that. The argument being that one of these days, scientists are going to come up with some brilliant solution that's going to all of a sudden make wind unbelievably profitable and all this money will be paid back. It won't. There's no science on the horizon right now that is going to make solar anywhere more profitable than a particular, it by a bit, but not by orders of magnitude that leaps forward. And also, as the solar goes forward, so does nuclear. The pebble bed reactor is far superior to the, the previous generation's reactor. It was the world leading, still is the world leading reactor. Those things are going to become the solutions of the future. We've got to, we've got to cut the nonsense and get serious. To me, alternative energy means the right solution for the right challenge. It means everybody switching their brains on, including the lawyers. And I don't mean that as a joke. I mean we need to have, everybody's got to get into this. We've got to get the economists and the lawyers and the scientists and everybody's got to get in on this and say, how do we all get together and solve this? Because scientists sometimes come up with bright ideas that are either illegal or they financially impractical and so on. So the scientists and the engineers must get together with the other guys and say, what can we actually achieve? All the economists and the lawyers tend to project all the economics into the future on the assumption that the science will never change. And all the scientists tend to project the science into the future on the assumption that the economics will never change. Both are wrong. To me, the alternative now is to find the right solution for the right challenge. We need energy, we being the whole of Africa. We must all work together on this thing. And it must be inexpensive. We cannot go looking at supposed solutions that the Danish people have got and so on, which they, they, they kid you incidentally. I don't know if there's anybody from Denmark here. But they keep telling you how much wind energy they've got. What they tell you is how much installed capacity they've got, not how much they actually get out of that. Now, the wind is only performing 20% of the time. So whenever you see the, the Danish figure, we've got so much, always take four-fifths out. And so what they actually get is one-fifth of that, if they're lucky. And then also, every time... 
The wind fails, they pick up the telephone and they phone the Germans and they buy nuclear power. We don't have that luxury. South Africa is an island. We cannot pick up the telephone to Mozambique or Angola or something and say, by the way, can we just please buy a few megawatts in from you? We, we need it at the moment. We're on our own. We've got a very good Southern African power pool agreement, which is wonderful, and we should pursue it. But I make the analogy, it's like this, the nursery school teacher and the nursery, and I mean no offense to any of our African country neighbors here, but the size of electricity we're talking about is like the nursery school teacher and the children, and they say, if one of us falls over and breaks our leg, the others take us to hospital. If the teacher falls over and breaks her leg, there's very little chance that the kids are taking the teacher to hospital. So we've got to work together with our colleagues, uh, but our, our requirements are substantial. We must be responsible towards the environment. Uh, some of the extreme greens, the rock around the rainforest crowd, love to go and attack me and the press and so on and say, Dr. Kim is in favor of nuclear and whatever, and he just says, to hell with the environment, I don't care a darn. I've never, ever, ever, ever said that, and I'm regularly accused of this. It's just not true. We have to be sensible. We've got to be conscious of all of these things. And so my appeal is we've got lots of intellectual capacity to use. We've got a lot of brain power. There's a lot of potential, not only in South Africa, but all our neighboring countries. Guys have got all sorts of cunning ideas already. Let's employ all of these, but we've got to get out there and get genuine electricity at a genuine price that really makes a difference. Then we will surge ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, without any further ado, uh, let's uh, look at the issue. And the issue here is projected in 100 years. That is very long as far as I'm concerned. But uh, I just wanted to show uh, this graph because it effectively just shows us what the clean energy need really is. And if one then looks at the different perspectives on, on low nuclear growth on the one hand and high nuclear growth, one sees that we are already in deep trouble. So I'm not going to uh, labor this point. It's interesting and it uh, can be seen on the World Nuclear Association's Nuclear Century Outlook. This is our critical problem at the moment. You see, in South Africa, We've got a number of plants that if we look at our uh, current uh, slide, well, the, 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 the curve as it, as it stands there, and pardon me for not mentioning the colors because I'm colorblind, uh, but uh, one sees the point there where the demand starts exceeding supply. Uh, Eskom knew about this quite some time ago. They've been told this over and over, and I was at that time part of the strategy team that actually uh, presented these curves. And what one can see is that uh, we are getting into serious trouble, and we better make decisions now. Uh, the costs of the blackouts in 2008, Leon Lowe, I believe, will speak later or has spoken already, but uh, he, from the Free Market Foundation, together with some other economists, have put the cost of the 2008 blackouts at a whopping 315 billion rand. Uh, that could pay for two power stations, two bindupis. Uh, it could wipe out 100% of the housing backlog in this country. It could also wipe out 130% of the roads backlog. This is what has happened already, ladies and gentlemen. Now, uh, I just want to put up this uh, little plant to the, uh, the right-hand top. Uh, it's a lovely little plant where I've spent some time and uh, where they tested. It's a nuclear, little nuclear reactor where they've tested the nuclear fuel and it was built in a time when people were actually, uh, they designed that plant before they've, they've uh, designed the fuel. And they used it as a test bed for the fuel. And all of this was made av available to South Africa at virtually no cost. Uh, to the bottom right-hand corner, there is a Chinese plant. It's in operation today. And to the left uh, bottom, of course, is the high-temperature pebble uh, design layout, which is quite a dramatic change and the total cost that went into developing that fuel, made available to South Africa, where we could start our development on, was uh, estimated at around about 2 to 3 billion euros. Now, there are a number of issues. If we were to look at energy today, if we look at electricity or sustainable energy today, then there are a number of issues that we need to address. Apart from the fact that, ladies and gentlemen, it's going to cost us a lot of money anyhow, no matter what form of energy we take. I ask myself always the question, 9 billion rand has been spent on the PBMR so far. 
and I will show you the figures of people that we have produced uh, at the universities. I will show you some programs ongoing and so on uh, of what was going on. At the drop of a hat, they spent $12 billion in building a number of stadia for the Soccer World Cup. It was a great event. But I'm asking myself, how many PhDs have been produced in that program? How many masters uh, have been produced during that program? Just a simple question. The issues that needs to be addressed when we talk about sustainability of energy is that of security of supply. I will address that a little bit because I'm also going to introduce uh, or will talk about uh, my favorite topic at the moment, and that is the use of thorium uh, instead of uranium. Then the second issue is financial viability. Does it make sense? I was uh, quite amused to listen to, uh, to our friend from the WWF this morning making the point that nuclear doesn't make sense uh, if you exclude carbon taxes. We have never included carbon taxes at all in our financials, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, I can tell you that uh, it is uh, quite interesting if we note today that the cheapest electricity produced in the world today is by France, and they are 80% nuclear. Uh, maybe that rings a bell. Uh, what we are also looking at is intrinsic safety. When I talk about intrinsic safety in nuclear, I mean guaranteed by laws of nature and not by some operator action or some, uh, some, somebody doing some quick actions there. It should be greenhouse gas emission free. I'm convinced of that. And uh, I think any form of energy that we start introducing today, we do have, for all the reasons that we've listened to today, uh, and, and I maybe could just mention the fact, uh, since I've just returned from France, where they do reprocessing of their fuel. Uh, what they do is they take their spent fuel elements, chop it up in pieces, dissolve, dissolve this in sulfuric acid, where only the metallic components remain. The rest, they flow over beds. They get all the uranium, the remaining uranium that's in there, uh, take that out, the plutonium, get that out and work that into MOX fuel, and then the minor actinides and the rest, the fission products, uh, in, uh, it's, is left over. What's interesting is the average Frenchman in his lifetime, including the dec decommissioning of all their plants, will produce two kilograms of waste in his lifetime. That's a brick size uh, that he will be pr producing in his lifetime. Now compare that to our interesting coal habits in South Africa where we produce just the CO2 per capita on average in this country. Per capita, per annum, is 20 tons. Okay? It should be also proliferation resistant. What that means is you shouldn't be able to take whatever comes from that reactor after it's been used and put it to mischievous use. Then the waste should be manageable. And a very important point, I don't care how much energy you've got installed. If you can't use it when you switch on the switch, if I have to wait for or I have to go pray to Ra to send me some rays or do anything funny, I can tell you then it's worth nothing as far as I'm concerned. Okay? Uh, right. The status of uranium resources uh, in this country, oh, in the world, sorry. The 30, 23rd edition of the NIA IEA Red Book states that enough uranium exists for about a 100 years supply. World Energy Outlook 2010 projects growth scenarios that could dramatically adjust this figure downward. Okay? There is a so-called M2M program ongoing where they take from Russia, they take their weapons-grade uranium and downblend it to reactor-grade uh, uh, uranium and then use it there. That's coming to an end, which will suddenly put an added 30% requirement on the uranium people from the uh, start of next year. The Chinese nuclear program alone, ladies and gentlemen, I don't care what anybody else says, this is what the Chinese are saying, and what they say they usually mean. That's what I've learned from the Chinese. 80 gigawatts nuclear by 2020. Okay, we are haggling about 9.6 gigawatts by 2030. Right? 200 gigawatts new nuclear by 2030. 400 gigawatts nuclear by 2050. This is going to place a massive, massive requirement on our uranium resources worldwide. Stephen Kidd, Director of Strategy and Research at World Nuclear Association, said, fourth generation reactors would be crucial if China was to avoid a serious bottleneck in uranium supplies in the coming decades. The speed of development would depend on how fast the country can commercialize current technologies if you go to 300 or 400 gigawatts of total capacity, you're going to have to start to look at something else because of the high cost uh, of uranium. 
this is just the pedigree of the reactors we've been talking about. Uh, this is what supplied to South Africa the background uh, to what we have been doing. This is stuff that started in the early 50s. Just want to put out this figure um, because of the thorium that we've been looking at. The first reactors that really started operation operated on thorium, okay, thorium fuel. People ask me, why, did, why didn't they go for thorium? Because they couldn't produce weapons-grade material from thorium. That was the reason why they didn't continue with this. They went for uh, uranium. We have done the study. People ask me, why is thorium so attractive? I just want to make this point because this might answer uh, a lot of the questions. If U-233 uh, captures a neutron, it either fissions or becomes U-234. Now, remember, it's only upwards of 235 that it becomes so-called minor actinides. So, in the neutron spectrum, what happens here is that one finds that there's an 88% chance for fissioning taking place with U-233. This is what you breed when you use uh, thorium. Uh, if you use uranium-235 as it's done in the normal cycle, there's only a 76% chance of that taking place. If you use plutonium, it's only 41%, 239, and 241, 59%. Let me just go down to the, and I can sh show, I, I can tell you why this is such a wonderful material and so on. We have also in South Africa produced fuel. This is just a graph of analysis, and analysis being done by the guy that actually uh, was world leading in the pebble fuel development in Germany. He was worked in Germany, US, every all over the world. And South Africa has done their first fuel, put it in a reactor, they tested it, came out to be the best fuel produced so far worldwide. Okay? This happened quietly, part of the nine billion spent. Then this is very interesting to me, Mrs. Hogan said, it's absolutely clear from all the high-level reviews that have been undertaken that there's no doubt about the validity of PBMR technology itself. The main feature of the PBMR is that its safety features are inherent in the physics of the design, as opposed to add on engineered safety features as found in current light water reactors. Both the United States and China are actively engaged in further developing this technology while South Africa is earning a reputation as been at the cutting edge of these developments. This is a remarkable achievement for a developing country and something of which we are justifiably proud. She went on and said, so we're shutting down the PBMR and we will build LWR technologies. Ladies and gentlemen, it seems like she is sighing absolutely uh, you know, giving a sigh of relief that finally we can follow again. I want to stop with this because I believe that we can debate do we re really need strong leadership in this country or not? I think that's the answer. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> can Africa lead? Definitely. Why am I so confident? Because I believe that in intellect is not geographically distributed. There are smart people all over the world. Can Africa lead in uh, nuclear energy? Well, the uh, quotation from the minister shows that we have been leading with the PBMR. Question is, so what happened with it? Well, a postmortem needs to be done. But in my view, based on uh, uh, an analysis of the uh, technology commercialization process for a decade, which is uh, how long I've been in technology investing. I believe that it's probably because there was an emphasis on the science and not on strategy. And uh, many a time, I mean, there are so many companies, private companies, not in the nuclear field, uh, which have lost huge opportunities because of an overemphasis on the science at the expense of strategy and good commercial practice. Is there, are there illustrations of the fact that Africa can lead? Yes, they are. I have them in my portfolio. I've got a company which has got a water treatment solution for the global shipping industry. We're in partnership with the biggest marine repair and maintenance company in the world. It's an exclusive partnership. We were classified by Frost and Sullivan last year as the most entrepreneurial company in the world within that field. I'm just coming back from Silicon Valley with a semiconductor solution, which the world is waiting for. That will cause computer chips to communicate using light rather than conductors. 
There are many teams in the world where we will try to do this and failed. And the only team that has been left standing is a research group at the University of Pretoria. I've got an ignition switching system for the automotive industry that it will need for the new environmentally friendly engines that uh, the stringent environmental standards in Europe are going to require. OEMs in Europe are waiting for us to go and test this system within the next six months or so because they've looked everywhere and they haven't found a better alternative. So I think that does address the question.